So hello everybody, hope you're doing well. This is gonna be a little bit of a different video today because Wiley has just given me authorization, at least for the moment, to uh, make a video of their uh, textbook PowerPoint. So this textbook PowerPoint is for chapter 13, which is financial statement analysis. They call it a big picture. Uh, a, the textbook authors are Paul Kimmel, Jerry Weingan, and Jill Mitchell. Uh, the PowerPoint used in the presentation is copyright 2023 by John Wiley and Sons. All rights are reserved. This is for educational purposes only. The video may not be distributed or redistributed with that, without the express permission of Wiley. This PowerPoint presentation is copyright 2023 by Bennett Tchaikovsky. All rights are reserved. Uh, the opinions contained within this presentation are those of myself and not the authors of the textbook or of Wiley. So before we get going, what I'm going to kind of go through and do is not change substantially uh, what they have gone through or what Diane Tanner has gone through and done in terms of making this uh, presentation. So they typically have these listed out by various different learning objectives, uh, sustain sustainability of income and quality of earnings, sustainable income is the most likely level of income to be obtained by a company in the, in the future important because the value of a company is the amount, function, and timing and uncertainty of its future cash flows. This differs from actual net income by the amount of unusual revenues, gains, losses included in the current year's income. It's of interest to analysis, uh, to analysts, and then helps them drive an estimate of future earnings without the noise of unusual items. So what we're going to be talking about in this part are things such as discontinued operations. So this topic, I would never touch in a lower division managerial accounting course. I typically introduce this in intermediate accounting when I'm going over income statement topics. Why is discontinued operations so important to highlight? Well, just remember is that there's an assumption. When a company has an income statement, it's assumed without anything else that these are the normal operations. And so when you have a company, if we kind of go over here and look at, let's go ever go to meta platforms. Okay, so meta platforms, their most recent 10Q, formerly known as Facebook. If we come down over here, right? They show income from operations, you show additional items over here, and then you have down below, you have net income, right? So again, the concept here, unless anything is said, it's all going to be from what we call continuing operations. However, kind of what this is alluding to here, if we're disposing of a business and then we're no longer going to be going through and operating it, what we need to go through and do is to come over here and let's take a look at eBay. And eBay, if you look at their income statement, they have a whole separate part over here that shows their net income or loss per share from continuing operations. And then over here from discontinued operations. So the way we handle this is that if as a business, we decide to go through and cut off one of the parts of our operations, right? So this, I think, was a division that was out of Korea. If we could decide to go through and say, hey, no longer, we have to go back through and restate prior year's financial informations to basically separate out the discontinued operations. This is shown net of tax below continuing operations. Again, it's to highlight to the user that we're no longer in this business, therefore it needs to be separated out. If you're taking my managerial accounting course, right at any point in time, there is no way you're going to see this um, tested on an exam. If you're my managerial accounting honors course, you may see it because if you chose eBay as a company to look at or another company that has discontinued operations, we'll have to talk about it, but there's no way I would test it until you reach intermediate accounting. So this is really what discontinued operations are. Again, 
not using it anymore. So we have to kind of go through and see it. So in my opinion, <laughs> the best way to illustrate it is to actually show you SEC filings, okay? Now over here, you have over here, what is non-recurring mean? And what you'll see over here is that many companies incur restructuring charges as they attempt to reduce costs. They oftentimes label these items in the income statement as a non-recurring charge to suggest that they are isolated events unlikely to occur in future periods. This is really, and they're absolutely right about this. It's like, so is this really a one-time charge or are they going to have to kind of continue going on and dealing with it? So again, you know, when you see over here, I uh, essentially with going back to the comprehensive, not comprehensive income, but non-recurring. And let's see if we can find an example. And I think there's a sale at Macy's. Okay, so let's take a look at our sale at Macy's. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested in kind of going through and looking at how this kind of works, um, please feel free. I've got a bunch of different videos on this and you can kind of see how this works. So over here, impairment, restructuring, and other costs. They're not going to be shown like discontinued operations as a separate component below net income. But what we're essentially doing is we are highlighting, right? Remember the overall objective of financial reporting. It is to give the users the very best uh, information to make decisions, right? So that's what we're trying to do, but it's all historical. But as we're giving that information, what we can do is we can highlight certain things. So right over here, we've got Macy's has an impairment, restructuring and other costs. And so we're kind of going through and telling the reader or the user of the financial statements that, hey, these are costs that we're going to be going through and expecting to happen in the, in the foregoing months. And if we look at, if I just go through here and look at impairment, restructuring and other costs, okay, right, so this is related to, for the first nine months, was a write-off of, of capital software assets, right? So EBITDA, they're kind of going through and again, explaining this over here. And then they're going, showing over here as an adjusted net income. Now you can go through and do this, right? This is non-GAAP information and companies can do this, but you have to be very, very careful about how you do this. You have to first go through and disclose the regular GAAP information then you can show additional amounts. So as you can kind of see here, Macy's is trying to help the analysts and the and the investors kind of see, well, what's going on over here with the impairment restructuring and other charges. So the other kind of, this kind of also kind of gives a rise as well. If the company has these impairment charges, like when does it end, right? Macy's is kind of in a little bit of a, you know, they're having some challenges right now. Their impairment costs, is, they've had a lot just because they've written off a lot of goodwill. That's really going to kind of come into play when they have an investor call, when they're giving guidance. And if I'm an investor, I want to kind of know, well, like, what else do you expect to hit? So uh, let's go back over here. So that's like a non-recurring charge, but you still, it's going to still be a part of that uh, it's still going to be part of uh, uh, deducting derived at net income. Okay. Comprehensive income. What is that? Let's go find out over here and look at our friends at Apple. Okay, I love Apple, not just because I'm making this on a Mac mini, but I also like it because their financial statements are awesome. Sorry, everybody else. You guys got to do a lot of catch up work. Uh, not perfect, but they're pretty awesome. And this is what I always use to kind of go through and to teach. So Apple, let's take a look at their balance sheet. Apple has $352 billion of assets. Of those $352 billion, approximately $144 billion are marketable securities. When we purchase securities, and this could be I'm buying... Southern California Edison bond that is going to pay uh, or commercial paper that'll give me a return of say six or 7%. It's the company has excess money 
that it's choosing to strategically invest, right? Just it's a place you're basically holding funds. And so when we look over here at Apple, right, you see this amount of marketable securities. Now, this again, this is taught in intermediate accounting. It is not taught in managerial accounting, at least for my class. When you're going through and doing the accounting for marketable securities, you have to record them at market, right? So what ends up happening? Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's go over here and let's pretend. So we're Apple, right? We have 144 billion. I'll just write it like this and write it in millions, okay? So this is what we have in security. And we'll say this is as of 9-30-22. Let's say as of 12-31-22, and I'm, again, these financial statements have not been released. This is for educational purposes only. I'm just making a guess here. What if the value of the securities was now 122, that one, me, 122 billion? Okay, so probably is not going to be that, but I'm just, you know, guessing. I'm just kind of using as a hypothetical. If we didn't sell any securities between September 30th and December 31st, right, under our investments, on our balance sheet as of 9.30.22, our investments were showing over here at 144 billion. But however, now it's at 122, but I didn't sell any, right? So because we have to show our investing securities at market value, what we're going to go through and do is we're gonna recognize over here, well, I've got the investments and then my net investments as of 1231.22, I'm going to have to show an allowance, and that is basically to show an allowance or an adjustment to show securities at market value. So if I look at this in terms of being a T account, right? This is, by the way, all, all an intermediate accounting. It's not going to be taught over here. I'm just showing you because it's being talked about in the PowerPoint slide. So I'm kind of going with that. So we have investments at market, or we'll have our investments accounts over here. They're at 144. And this is as of 9 30 22. Now to show this as of 12 31 22, we need to be showing this at a value of 122, that basically 122 billion. So what we're going to do is we're going to have an allowance for investments at market. So what I need here to show this at $122 billion on my balance sheet, I'm going to need a credit for $22 billion. Okay. Now, for every credit, I need a debit. Now, what does this look like? Well, they went down in value. So it looks like a loss. But if you go back to the original hypothetical that I was sharing with you, they didn't sell anything. So what this is called is this is going to be an unrealized holding loss on marketable equitable securities. And we would then go through over here and basically credit this over here to the allowance for investments to market value again. If you're taking my class for managerial accounting, this is stuff we deal with in intermediate. So don't freak out. If we come over here and I look at this unrealized holding loss on marketable securities, this is not a realized loss. If it was realized, I would be showing it over here. And I would be also, I would be showing this unrealized holding loss on the income statement all day. But instead, what Apple has to go through and do is there, there's this concept that's talked about over here of something called comprehensive income. What does comprehensive income tell us? If I come down over here and look at the income statement, right? I've got net income. 
Then I come over here and I look at the statement of comprehensive income. What this takes into account for are a few different things. Does Apple do business worldwide? Absolutely, yes. When they're doing business worldwide, their financial statements have to get translated from the foreign currency to the domestic currency, which is the US dollar. Do fluctuations occur? Absolutely, yes. So when you see fluctuations in foreign currency, when you see changes basically over here of derivative instruments, uh, net gains and basically over here, these are going to be where your all your unrealized gains and losses are going to be kind of going into. Now, that's the first part of this. The second part of this as well, hey, Bennett, if we're you know hitting this over here and we're putting this over on the balance sheet at the unrealized holding loss, that doesn't goes on the comprehensive income statement, but where does the other side of it go to? Because normally we're going to close out the uh, income losses into retained earnings. Well, there's a very special component of retained earnings and it's called accumulated other comprehensive income or loss. So what happens over here is that this accumulated other comprehensive income or loss, what this happens is like right over here. So any type of unrealized gains or losses on securities, any kind of foreign currency translation adjustments is going to fall into this category right here because they're unrealized. Again, once they become realized, they'll float up into retained earnings. But for now, that's how they're going to be going through. But it's because it comes back over here. The real reason is we have to show our marketable securities at market value. That's the whole important thing behind this. So, and as you can see, out oh, of the market decline in 2022, uh, yeah. And that's why you're seeing this dip. I'm sure that's the explanation. Okay. So that's what goes into comprehensive income unrealized gains or loss, realized gains and losses, unrealized, again, we're just changing the valuation, again, for marketable securities. Realized gains or losses, we're going to report them normally on the income statement. Remember, this comprehensive income is only going to be for those, unre those uh, unrealized gains and losses. Again, trading securities available for sale, statement of comprehensive income. Again, this is all stuff that I teach in intermediate accounting. And again, you kind of see here some more examples, uh, changes. In, okay, so over here. Okay, so changes in accounting principle. One of the things is that when you decide to go through and, you know, change it, you have to go through and uh, basically show pro forma amounts uh, using the old principle as well as basically the new principle. I'm not going to talk about it in depth right here because it's not really that frequent. Once you adopt FIFO, and they really, why do they not allow changes in accounting principle? Why do they do not like it is because, well, I'm at FIFO this month and next month FIFO gives me more income. Yeah, it's, it's you know, a fancy way to kind of turn around and try to generate and manipulate income. That's why once you choose an accounting principle, you're generally not going to go away from it. Okay. Quality of earnings. I, and again, pro forma income, it's like, so if you have to give a lot of explanation on your financial statements in terms of what's happening, you know, that can really be a problem. But at the same time, when you go through over here, and if you look at, let's go to our friends at Meta Platforms. And for those of you who have watched my videos before, you'll kind of see me talk about this. And the thing about Meta, which is really interesting, is that you see this net income, and then you see this thing right over here, share-based compensation expense included in costs and expenses. This is $3.1 billion. Why is that important? It's because generally, when you give somebody a stock option, you debit stock compensation expense. And what you end up crediting, it's not a liability, because remember, when you give somebody a stock option, you just generally say, hey, here's an option to buy a share of Meta at 150 bucks. Why don't you pay me 150 and I'll give you a share? There you go. So what you're going to do is you're going to be crediting additional paying capital common stock. So what ends up happening is that when you go through and look at stock compensation expense, 
this isn't really, in my opinion, it's not really an expense. I mean, it is an expense for, for, for Gap, and I would never tell a company not to report it. But for an investor, it's like, hey, this isn't real because there's no liability. There's no payout. You just have to give them shares. So when we look over here at Meta, what they've done is they've highlighted this amount, right? They've highlighted this over here so they can go tell their investors is like, hey, you've got three, four point three billion of net income. And then over here, you've got this. This is really this four point three billion should really be if I add back to three point one, you're really looking at closer to seven point four billion. So again, that's really a really important part of this in terms of trying to kind of go through and understand how these, how the different companies, you know, go through and report it. But I really applaud Meta for highlighting this below because I think it's very useful information for shareholders. So when you see this quality of earnings, that's an example in terms of how do you get better information to, uh, how do you get better information to your investors? And I'm just going to pause really quickly because I do want to share something with you. So one of the classes I teach, I do teach intermediate accounting. And so when you look at this, one of the great things about the intermediate accounting textbook is they have, this is what I grew up on. So over here, if you look at the overall objective of financial reporting, it's to provide information about the reporting entity that is useful and to present and to, to present and potential equity investors, lender and other creditors and their capacity as capital providers. This is the why of accounting. Remember. You have to always, there's all these different parts in here, and you'll learn about this when you take intermediate accounting, but it's really, really important to understand is that when we're going through and doing this, we are really going through in here. Our objective is to give the investor the best possible information. So uh, alternative accounting methods. So if you're, you know, inventory methods is LIFO, FIFO and LIFO. And again, you know, it's one of those things where if you're in a certain industry, you're going to be much better off uh, choosing a method that is consistent with those that are in your industry. Like for example, if Home Depot is using FIFO, if other retailers use FIFO, then that's something that Lowe's or somebody else should kind of be going through and doing as well. Okay. So over here, uh, pro forma income. And what you're really doing over here is you're saying, okay, here's how bad our net income was. If I add back stock compensation expense, some warranty liability stuff, then that can actually make me look better because all these different accounting parts have been hit on it. The thing to remember is this is talking about non-gap information. You have to tell the investor when you're doing an earnings call, when you're doing a press release, you have to say that this is non-GAAP. Very, very important to do, or you're going to be getting a visit from the Securities and Exchange Commission, and we don't want to do that. Okay. So over here, uh, you'll see some kind of cha challenges is basically uh, it's companies that basically take too much expense, capitalization of, ex of operating expenses. I think that was WorldCom. They found out that the auditors weren't looking at anything above below five grand, and they started capitalizing everything under below five grand and wrote it off over time. Uh, channel stuffing, and then you're buying early, but it's you know a lot of this stuff. Honestly, as a company, if you're doing business and if it makes sense, do it. Don't do it because of some accounting part, right? This that's something you always want to kind of keep in mind. Okay. So quality of again, all everything I've covered into this so far is something that if you're taking my class, um, I'm not going to be going through and, and testing you on this. So the last, like all these different times are going to be like, you know, uh, something that you won't see. Okay. So intracompany comparisons. Uh, this is basically when we're looking at our company year over year or period over period. So an intracompany uh, comparison, if we went over here to Meta, for example, you know, what happened for the three months ended September 30th, 2022 by 2021, why did revenue dip? Why is net income lower, right? We kind of all know pre and post whistleblower. 
in terms of what's been happening. So as you go through and look at this, and obviously they're putting more money into R&D, uh, but when you go through and look at this, this is really where you're kind of comparing uh, basically what's happening at a company. Let's refer to intra-company. So if we have over here, if we say over here, okay, so uh, let's take a look. So if we look at over here, just like research and development, right? So I'm, what I'm looking for specifically is that here's, here's a, for example, this is how like when, you, when a company reports its financial results, they'll go through and they'll say, okay, well, like what is research and development, what are research and development expenses? They're talking about like the results of operations and then they'll kind of hopefully give you a clue. So over here, so R&D expenses in the three and nine months ended increased 2.85 billion or 45% respectively compared to the same periods in 2021. This is what we'll call shortly as what we call a horizontal analysis, right? When you're comparing like, okay, this is going up. The increases were mainly due to higher payroll and related expenses as a result at a 32% employee headcount from year to year. In engineering and other technical functions, supporting in our investment and in basically our continued investment in our family uh, products and said RL, Ralph Lauren. I don't know. I think it's Reality Labs. Uh, to a lesser extent, RL technology costs are also con contributing to the increase. So again, when you look at this over here, as we're going back through and saying, okay, you know, how do we go through and compare it? That's the companies take. Now the analysts will kind of go out and look at other things to make sure that that makes sense. And that's what they'll go and put out in their analyst report. So intercompany comparisons. Okay. So intra is within, inter is without, or at least this is according to Wiley. Um, intercompany comparisons, we're looking against other companies. Now, if I'm doing this, what I want to compare, right? If I'm looking over here at Meta, do I want to compare Meta to Macy's. Well, if you said Bennett, they both start with our meta. Let's see here. Where did that go? I guess we lost Macy's. But if we were going to compare our, like, for example, our eBay and meta. Hope you didn't catch that sneeze. Bless myself. So over here for eBay, does eBay compare with meta? No, they are two different types of companies. So if we're trying to do an intercompany comparison, Meta might be better with Snap, right? You know, or if you kind of look at, you know, Apple may be better with Microsoft, Intel may be better with AMD. When you look at companies, you have to look at companies that are in the same industry or the intercompany comparison is going to be meaningless. And that kind of gets us to um, industry averages, comparisons within industry averages, and then provide uh, information about a company's relative position with the in, within the industry. So again, this is by far, and as I'm going through and reading this, this is why this material is so difficult to test. And this has really been hard for me in my time in terms of, well, how do I give this on an exam? Now, the best way to do it is I have my students do a paper and the paper based, basically that's how you cover financial statement analysis. But when we look at this over here, it's like, this is again, you know, I'll kind of might be testing on part of this, but not to this kind of depth. Okay. So horizontal, vertical, and ratio analysis. Okay. So horizontal analysis is what I was just showing you basically with, uh, with Facebook or excuse me, with meta platforms. We looked at the research and development and it went up, right? Why did it go up? And this is what we call a trend analysis. Like why is a certain expense increasing, why is cash increasing, all those different types of things. So there's a horizontal analysis, and that's what that really means. So as you're kind of going through over here, what you would see is that you would define one of these over here as the base year. I think I did an exercise in Wiley that went through and did this. And that's how you go through and do the computation. Again, I've gone through and I've done this in uh, basically the in uh, the exercise, the only thing I didn't do 
is I didn't go through and basically, if you set 2021 as your base, obviously from, if you took 96.14 minus 88.12, divided the difference by 88.12, you get 191.1%. 191 this 10177 is also being compared to the base year. So you're basically, you choose a base year. And if you're doing a horizontal analysis, again, that's how you could go through and do it. Uh, that's something that, again, some investors will kind of go through and use. There's also something called uh, Kegger or compound annual growth rate. Remember, as you're going through and doing financial statement analysis, what I would suggest doing is being on invest. Stapedia, right? Look at all the different stuff that's on there. And that's the way you're going to learn it. Best way to do it is you can kind of go through my YouTube channel and you can find a project that I gave for students. And if you follow along with that, you can see me doing a very basic uh, financial statement analysis. Okay. So over here, we're going through and doing this. We're talking about just the general percentage increases. This is actually kind of important just in terms of knowing how to go through and compute them. So I would kind of go through and refer to the exercises. So when you look at this over here, um, and again, these are in thousands. So they say, oh, 40, 44, 40, 20, it's an increase of the, the change of 24. So the current liabilities, if I take the, the 24 divided by 40, 20, which is the first year, that's an increase of 0.6%. Okay. Over here, this again is doing the same thing with uh, a horizontal analysis and so vertical. Now, this is something we call, it's also ca called common size financial statements. And this is what I always call it. What you do is you, and this is very important, right? So on the balance sheet, dividing everything for that year by total assets, on the income statement, I'm dividing everything by net sales. So over here, total assets is going to be shown as 100%. We show over here, oh, current assets, 2.7 million is basically 23% of all total assets. So again, you it's a very important thing to look at common size because it can tell us where we need to look at when we go through and do our ratios. Okay, so again... I've done exercises that kind of go through and walk through this. So I'm not going to go through and do uh, their part of it. So again, on the income statement, we're dividing everything by net sales. Okay. So this is something, again, very important to know how to do, especially for my exams, because I will give you uh, questions on this. Okay. Over here. So uh, data check vertical analysis, I'm taking you know, 98,000 98, divided by 1.45 million, that's going to get 6.8%. Plan assets, this is 38%. Um, and there you go. Um, this is WorldCom. So WorldCom, I think they were the ones who did, right, just under five grand, and then they would capitalize it. Fun stuff. Okay, ratio analysis. Okay, so this is where we kind of like, we start looking at the different ratios. You have liquidity. Um, liquidity, they're also kind of, with Wiley, they're also saying activity. It, you can, it, honestly, you can really kind of going Investopedia, okay? Everybody's going to define it differently. If you walk into a company and you're being asked to do this, they may have may have their own way of doing it. So just kind of go through and go with the flow. Uh, if we look over here, uh, ratios, again, they're one part of it, what I would call a quantitative analysis, meaning that I'm using numbers to analyze a company. There is also the consideration though of qualitative analysis, right? So if I look back over here and look at WorldCom, if I did a deep dive background into the personnel at WorldCom, what would I have found? Who were the people that were behind the shows and the accounting? And usually you'll find it's not CPAs. It's um, salespeople that are really trying to go through and manipulate the numbers. Again, it's my opinion. Uh, but you know, when you're looking through at the qualitative side of financial statement analysis cannot be understated. It's who the people are. 
um, you know, other non-financial factors that you're going to be kind of looking at. And even I haven't seen, I'm, you know, been around for a bit, uh, but I haven't seen everything. So there you go. But these are the general classifications in terms of the ratios. And they're just to kind of help us give a quick look look into companies. Now, why these can be important is that if a bank is giving a loan to somebody and they say, hey, you have to have a quick ratio of X of, you know, three to one, and you fall below that ratio, then you have to have a discussion. So again, it's something that it's important to kind of understand how these work. Uh, ratios, they can provide clues, the underlying conditions, and this is very true. They are not meaningful as a single ratio. You have to look at as a total, uh, as a total part. So here are some things: intra-company. So we're looking period over period, industry averages, intercompany comparisons against a principal competitor. So I did problem thirteen two and thirteen five uh, from this textbook, um, and you can kind of go through and see how those are. Um, liquidity ratios measure the ability of a company over to survive over a long period of time. That's going to be false because the liquidity ratios are basically, can I pay off my current liabilities? Intercompany comparisons are used to compare one company with another. No, it's false because it's doing it with itself. Ratios can provide clues to underlying conditions that may not be apparent from the individual financial statement component. Sure. We just saw it on the previous slide, so it's got to be true. Okay. So... The liquidity ratios over here, working capital, current ratio. I'm surprised it didn't do the quick ratio or acid test ratio, uh, inventory turnover, days in inventory, AR turnover, and then average collection period. I disagree with this, that they should have a quick ratio or acid test because current assets, if you have a company like Home Depot, let's pull them up. One of my favorite companies to look at. So if I look at the Home Depot and in looking at the Home Depot, let's see if they'll let me look at it today and we'll go back. There we go. So if I was to look at the current ratio for the Home Depot, I would say, okay, you've got 33 billion of current assets and then you've got 24 billion of uh, current liabilities. Now, when we look at current assets, right? Cash, it's cash. We can pay off the liabilities. Receivables, well, all those have already been sales that will hopefully slowly turn into cash. And then merchandise inventory. This we have to sell. So when you look at current the current ratio, that's not necessarily going to be a good ratio to look at if you're really trying to evaluate the liquidity of a company. So I think that, uh, again, I, you know, I would include the quick ratio. I don't know why they didn't do it, but I think it's missing. And it should be included in here. Okay. So again, uh, solvency ratios. So again, going back over here, let's, I'll just talk about these here. Inventory turnover, how fast are we selling our inventory? This is important because if our inventory is not moving, it can become obsolete for electronics manufacturers or uh, fat, uh, flat, uh, fast fashion. That can be a big problem. If we have a lot of receivables and we're not collecting it quickly, that also can indicate other problems. So over here, solvency ratios, um, how do we have the ability to uh, survive? Meaning that, you know, these are just a few of them, uh, debt to assets, meaning how leveraged are we? This is what's interesting. If I look at the Home Depot and let's go over here. Okay, so if I look at the Home Depot, there, what is it, debt to assets, Liabilities to assets is they look like they are heavily leveraged and they are, right? And it's a really bizarre thing because why are they so leveraged? Because they've spent $85 billion buying back their own stock. And that's where all their cash is gone, right? They didn't pay out a dividend. They decided to buy back their own shares. That's their choice. But 
it's not that Home Depot, if you look at this, it's not as though they're not a healthy company. They're just heavily leveraged, right? But when we look at Home Depot over here, the big question is, well, are they making enough income to cover their interest? And that's when we look at this over here is the times interest earned is that are they having enough income, you know, pre-tax, you know, pre-interest to cover their interest expense. So that's a very important ratio, right? Can they cover their debt payments or actually their interest payments? The debt payments, that's also, it's a different ratio that's called debt service coverage ratio. This is a very small sample of the ratios that are out there. With any accounting tax and even my videos, don't think, oh, this is like, you know, the word of the, of the person. And it's like, oh, this is, take this as truth. No, go to Investopedia, look it up. Uh, free cash flow. Um, this is not something I've really used, but it's cash provided by operating activities minus what your expenditures are and then minus any kind of dividends you're paying out. Uh, profitability. Return on shareholders' equity, meaning that how profitable are we using or what's our return on uh, owner's equity? By the way, most every single publicly traded company, they will not have preferred stock. It's because the SEC says no way. They don't like it at all. And it's for a variety of reasons. You have over here return on assets, uh, profit margin, asset turnover. Again, these are all just, you also can see the gross margin, which is how much profit we're making off the sale of our inventory. And that one over here is basically gross profit. So the gross margin, I would take 13 billion divided by 38, and that would give me my gross margin. The profit margin over here for the Home Depot, I would take 4.3 billion and divide it by 38 billion. Is that a good number? You'd have to compare it to others that are in the industry like Lowe's. Okay, so, oh, we got gross profit rate. I, I spoke too soon. Earnings per share, price earnings ratio, payout ratio. One of the other ones that you should definitely be looking at is the market to book ratio. Okay, so free cash flow is that liquidity, solvency, or profitability? I probably would say it's going to be solvency. Inventory turnover, it's an activity ratio, but in this case over here, it's liquidity. Return on assets. Ooh, that sounds like profitability. Price earnings, that also sounds like profitability. Asset turnover. Ew. Is that going to be liquidity? I think it might be mm, liquidity. Oh, God, I got that one wrong. I guess I failed my own test. Debt to assets, that's going to be solvency. And then average collection period, that would be liquidity. Okay. Okay, so over here, uh, again, there's outside rating agencies they've been burned in the past so it's something you always want to make sure you're doing your own research uh financial analysis and data analytics there is a lot of information uh out there and just so you can kind of see and i've i've done videos on this before but this is really kind of cool is that if we come over here and if i look at the home depot if i click on filing and I click on this button over here where it says interactive data, right? What I can do is I can basically download their entire queue or their financial statement portion as an Excel file, right? And Carolina is probably cringing right now because she is my favorite instructor at IBC. And she's my favorite because she always gets really frustrated uh, when I go through and, and use Google Sheets instead of Excel, but hopefully she's forgiven me over time. So this is something that you can kind of go over here and do and basically download the financial statements into Excel. So if your professor is asking you to kind of go through and do a project or something along uh, those lines, that's something that you could kind of go back through and, and do. So Let's go back over here. So again, uh, a lot of information that's out there. Um, Edgar Database CompuStat. I've never used that one. Um, there is something that I have used, but I'm not sure if it's if it's available publicly. That one is they take a filing statement and they compare it period over period to see how a company's changed its disclosures. Uh, and then over here, you're doing valuation models. Uh, and over here, you've got 
uh, Chicago serials uh, ratios. Okay, so um, this is just, again, this is a comprehensive uh, way to kind of go through and look at this. I'm going to kind of skip this just because it's, you know, I'm just kind of trying to do this here if you're trying to review it. But I just don't think it's, I've got other companies that I've done this for. I've got a project and I'll show you where that is real quick. Okay, so right over here in terms of my playlists, um, if you go and look at, I did a, and I'll put this link below if you want to go through and take a look at it. Um, financial statement. Okay, so right over here, this is the financial statement analysis that I went through and did. And I think uh, this is going through over here and okay. So if we come over here, and if we go to that over here, video within a video within a video. So I'm doing Home Depot. It's really creepy watching my own stuff. Oh, this is Twitter. What did I compare Twitter to? Did I do them to Meta? I can't remember. In any event, so there's these videos that are over here um, that you can kind of go through and see me do this part over here with uh, real companies. Um, you know, again, I think this is good. I mean, if you're looking for some thing that's already kind of like laid out for you as an instructor, this would be something that would be fine that could help me illustrate the concepts. I just am really much more of an advocate for whenever I teach accounting is to be using publicly traded companies. Because if a student, if I'm in class and I say, well, what do you want to do today to a student? They can say, well, I want to look at Tesla. Well, let's look at Tesla, right? And that brings up the question of, oh, can we compare Tesla with Lucid or Rivian? And probably not because Rivian and Lucid aren't that old. They're relatively young companies. They went public recently. So as you look at it, you know, in terms of, you know, in terms of these companies, you kind of like say, it's like, okay, um, you know, uh, does it make, you know, how do we go through and analyze companies? So I just think it's a lot better just to look at real publicly traded companies than looking at something like this. But again, if this is absolutely acceptable um, in terms of kind of going through, but I think it just, for me, it's just, it gives something where it's like, okay, um, you have the ability to kind of go through and look at a real life company rather than something that's just completely made up. Um, you know, but obviously for exams, we tend to go need to go through and use the companies that are made up companies. Okay, so let's go over here. So profit margin, profit margin, asset turnover. Okay, over here, gross profit rate, gross profit rate, earnings per share. Um, earnings per share, price. Okay, so one thing really quickly, I will talk about this, is that the price to earnings ratio, and this is actually something important. So if we look at Tesla, so Tesla right now is trading at 113. Its price to earnings ratio is at 34. What does this mean? Well, we would take the stock price, and then what we would go through and do is we would divide it by the earnings per share uh, for Tesla. And let me just show you how that's done real quick. Okay, so if we look at Tesla, and if I take, okay. so Tesla had earnings per share of roughly, so for the nine months ended, it was roughly about 284. So if we said just for fun that this is going to be about four bucks, 
if I take four bucks and divide it into the stock price, that would give me the price to earnings ratio, right? What is market cap? Market cap are my shares outstanding. So right over here with, uh, with Tesla, I would take my shares outstanding and see they don't have any preferred, but I would take my, you know, 3.1 billion shares or 3.1 million shares. And I'm going to be multiplying it that by the 116. Let me see here. Millions except share data. Okay. Amounts in, in millions, right? So I would have over here, I have 3.1 billion shares and I would be dividing this into my, uh, excuse me, I would be multiplying that 3.1 billion by 113. And that's how you get to the market capitalization. So again, something just to kind of understand now, the one thing I will say is that if you are, instead of the price to earn, earnings ratio, the ratio that I've been going through and having my students com compute, compute. I got to Investopedia. And if I type in over here, it might just be uh, easier to do is just a straight up Google search. We have the market book to market or market to book ratio, price to book, market to book. Basically what I'm doing over here in terms of going through and doing this is I'm taking my common shareholders equity divided by the market capitalization or book to market. But if I do market to book, I'm taking the market capitalization and dividing it by common shareholders equity. And when you're coming up though with common shareholders equity, and is basically the market to book. It's also called price to book. If basically you're looking at the net assets are kind of defined as being, you take the assets, you subtract out the, the book value to get to the book value per share. You're going to take out intangible assets. You're going to then, because it's a big thing. Then you're also going to take out total liabilities. And that's what you're going to be dividing into the market price per share or the market, I just take the market cap, divide it by this part here, and then just get rid of the per share part. But that's something you get the same result. But that's really what you're trying to kind of go through and do. And I think that that's possibly a better indicator than price to earnings, just because this takes into account items that really can't necessarily have value like goodwill or for, from an outside investor perspective. Okay, so... Right over here, price to earnings ratio. Um, again, is that a good P ratio? Depends on what it is in terms of the industry. Uh, payout ratio, this is with dividends. A lot of companies today, like the Home Depot, um, are not uh, sharing and are not uh, giving out dividends. They're just buying back stock instead. So when you kind of look at that, there's some stocks that do pay dividends pretty reliably. And that's something that people really want to kind of go through and look at. So I want to thank uh, Wiley for allowing me to make this presentation. It's extremely generous of them. And, you know, they're not paying me for this. Um, and again, uh, wow, the publisher assumes no responsibilities for errors, omissions, or damages caused by the use of these programs or for the use of the information contained herein. That's a pretty good disclaimer. I like it. Uh, but again, you know, this is uh, for educational purposes only. And I would really like to thank Wiley for allowing me to make this video. And I look forward to seeing you on future videos. Have a great one.